Uh, good evening, my name is Michelle Trampy. I'm with the Central Virginia Justice Initiative. I'm also the co-lead of the um, uh, Planning District 16 Human Trafficking Task Force and um, uh, an advisor to the Virginia um, Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Um, I wanna thank everyone who is joining us here in person as well as online. Uh, uh, we just ended uh, Human Trafficking Awareness Month uh, in January and um, I appreciate everyone, um, uh, you know, joining us uh, for, for this important discussion. So uh, with that, we're going to uh, start um, tonight uh, with a little bit of information. So a little bit of information to kind of get everybody on the same page with regard to what human trafficking is and what it's not. And then we're going to move over to a panel discussion. So uh, it's going to take about an hour um, and we're going to we're gonna try really hard to stick to, to that. So um, with that, can we move to the um, presentation? Okay. Um, so um, human trafficking, uh, uh, um, so what is human trafficking? Uh, human trafficking, also known as trafficking persons, is a crime that involves compelling or coercing a person uh, to provide uh, labor services or to engage in commercial sex acts through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. Now, the terms force, fraud, or coercion tend to be um, uh, the federal def definition, the uh, TVPA, which is the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Um, however, Virginia has a similar wording. Um, it's force, um, intimidation, and deception. Um, exploitation of a minor for commercial sex uh, in human is human trafficking regardless of whether any form of force, fraud, or coercion was used. That is the federal definition. There is a small um, uh, piece of the Virginia Code that actually allows minors who are engaged in survival sex um, um, uh, to actually be charged. Uh, human trafficking is really, though, about exploitation of another person's vulnerability for profit. So we want to talk about, um, we're here to talk about, um, you know, youth, children, we're in the schools. Um, and I, I, a couple of things I'd like to say that I, I did say is that we're so, um, uh, we're so thankful for being here um, in Spotsylvania. Um, Spotsylvania actually has been very involved in our task force. Um, and um, um, they're going to tell you some of the things that they've, they've done uh, a little later. But um, talking about children at risk, and to be honest, everyone's path to uh, every, um, everyone who has been victimized um, uh, by human trafficking actually gets there in, in different ways. But what we're going to do is talk about uh, really a bit of a risk profile for, for kids. Um, and while any child may be trafficked. Um, age really is um, is an important factor. Um, uh, you know, younger and younger uh, children um, they have they they are um, vulnerable just because of their age. They don't have control over. Um, uh, they may not have control over their their body. They may not have control over where they they don't have control over where they live, um, and they're dependent on others to do that. Boys and girls are both susceptible. Now, there are high-risk children for uh, human trafficking, and, um, uh, and, and, that, and so children dealing with trauma, so um, they're in a home where um, sexual abuse is the norm, or domestic violence is the norm, or uh, assault is the norm. Uh, when a trafficker does it later to them, it's their normal. Abandonment. Um, no resources, that includes runaways, and in fact, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, their largest uh, category is endangered runaways. Uh, not kids who are taken, that's about 0.3% of the kids that they're dealing with. Um, disruption, so maybe death of a parent, uh, foster care, in, you know, in and out of foster care, um, low self-esteem. Uh, self so, um, you know, children who are dealing with, uh, with, with these items or are, are, are with this type of a, a, a situation actually are more, um, are, are at higher risk for um, being a victim of human trafficking. Now, uh, statistically speaking, um, 
I want to throw some statistics. And there's an organization called Thorn, and um, they are advocates um, for for children who have been um, sexually exploited. And they, in a study of uh, 260 domestic minor sex trafficking survivors from about 27 survivor organizations. Um, they found that one in six um, of these um, survivors were trafficked under the age of 12. The common age of entry was 15. 75% um, who um, uh, entered the life after 2004 were advertised online, and 63% of victimized children uh, were advertised online. Um, some other statistics that they had was uh, that 50 to 90 percent of sex trafficking victims had been involved in the child welfare system. Now the reason why it's 50 to 60 is they had different um, studies and so they had different results depending upon the, the, the population. Um, but also 40 percent of uh, homeless uh, youth identifies LGBTQ, um, although they are 7 percent of the population. and so. Um, homelessness is is another risk factor. Um, um, uh, African American, Latinx ex populations are overrepresented in the victim population, um, and that's certainly linked to historical mar marginalization. So those are some statistics. Now, moving on, how do traffickers obtain victims? And so I'm going to split this into two pieces. One is familial, the other is non-familial. And I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on the familial um, um, because we, we actually have a, a survivor of familial trafficking who is on our panel this evening. Um, but familial traffickers involve family member trafficking another family member, uh, typically a, a, a minor. Um, Non-familial traffickers groom and lure their victims, and I know that a lot of folks are concerned about their kids being taken. That really doesn't happen um, uh, very often. I can't, I'm not going to say it, it can't happen. I'm just saying that is not the way that that um, you know traffickers really want to operate. They're trying to protect their business, right? So, um, uh, so they use grooming and luring methods because that garners less attention. Um, anyone, as we said, anyone can be a victim of human trafficking, but non-familial traffickers are really drawn to people who are um, vulnerable. And this really is about, um, human trafficking is about um, a person exploiting another, uh, another person's vulnerability for profit. Um, and they're looking for someone who is uh, vulnerable and who will easily depend upon them. Um, social media is a sig significant tool that's used to entrap teens, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And other places used to find teens are bus stops, shopping malls, employment opportunities like modeling scouts, skip parties, and through mutual friends. Now, non-familial -fami grooming, um, and there are a number of really good organizations out there, like Just Ask Prevention, uh, Richmond Just Justice Initiative, or RJI, who have um, really great prevention programs out there. Um, and so you'll, you, you'll see something maybe with different terms, but this is what we use is really there's, there are three stages, recruitment, connection, and entrapment um, when you're talking about uh, the grooming phases. And so recruitment really involves finding teens where adults aren't around. It's really that simple. Um, connection is where they um, are trying to create a connection. So showing interest in their lives, their hopes, their dreams. Um, buying the, may involve buying them presents. Um, pretending to have romantic feelings for them. Um, and so if you're dealing with, some, with, with a child with a lot of risk factors, they may not have connections to others. And so they're looking for someone to connect to. Um, they may begin the trafficking process by having them do things that will lead to trafficking. So for example, they may ask them to dance at a party for their friends, um, view pornography, um, trade sexual favors. And they may instill a sense of loyalty um, to the trafficker, to the street, um, in the teen rather than, um, than family and, and other um, others. Um, so entrapment really is where they make victims dependent upon them through drugs, alcohol, coercion. Um, so, and there are many ways to isolate a person. You don't have to actually lock them up in a room to do it. Um, again, going back to risk factors. So, if you have if you have kids with uh, multiple risk factors, they may already feel um, isolation. 
Um, you know, uh, uh, traffickers may threaten to release explicit pi pictures that they may have taken of the teen. They may threaten to harm family members. Um, teens may also feel a sense of financial obligation or feels that they really have no other option than to comply with a trafficker. Um, and, you know, in that connection phase where they may be buying them presents, um, they may be reminding them how much the presents cost and how much, um, you know, uh, um, um, you know, it, 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 it you know, put them behind. But um, what will eventually happen is that there is, is a, a time where they'll say something to the effect of, um, you only have to do this one time to get me out of this, um, this, this issue, this emergency. Um, or if you love me, you'll do this one, just one time. And it's never just one time. Um, so I gonna go through that really quickly. Um, usually we take a lot longer, but I want to get to the panel. Um, a couple of other things in terms of statistics. Thorne uh, research indicated that one in seven kids ages 9 to 12 shared their own nude photos online. Right? Shared their own nude photos online. One in five kids believe it's normal to do so. So if you're thinking about some of the conversations you need to be having with your kids, it's probably it. Um, according to Thorne, near, after nearly um, disappearing in the 90s, the spread of child sexual abuse material exploded with the rise of the internet. While child sex trafficking increased with exposure to a greater uh, market online, today the problem's complex and growing. And they gave an example of this, uh, center, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children will um, review um, uh, child sex, sexual abuse content online to determine whether or not um, a child that's missing actually may be showing up in some of that material. And so um, uh, in 2004, um, it was 250,000 um, child sexual, sexual abuse files that they reviewed. In 2019, it was 70 million. Think about that. Now, there's a lot more content out um, on the internet during that 15 uh, year period, but that is a tremendously large increase, tremendously large increase. Um, so we're just, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure, and some of the feedback when we did this a few years ago was, you know, just give us some practical things to, to, to do. And so we wanted to talk about some social media safety tips, uh, safety tips because particularly as, um, you know, uh, kids are spending more, more time online, more and more time online. So in terms of um, teens and preteens, there's some, there's some advice that we can give them. First, make sure social media accounts are private. That's good advice for parents, too. Um, do not respond to DMs from people you do not know. And if it sounds too good, it probably is. Share your passwords with a trusted adult um, in case of an emergency. And we realize that may or may not be, be a parent. Um, the Shared Hope International actually has some really good um, material for kids in terms of how to identify a trusted adult. Um, don't vent on social media. Uh, traffickers are really looking for someone who's unhappy in their situation, right? That's just a red flag. I'm unhappy in my situation. And don't share other people's personal information on social media. So for, for parents, um, some of the things that you can do is talk to your kids about social media safety. Do it over and over and over again. Uh, know who their friends are. And I, I know that's hard to, hard to do, but you know, be aware of their school attendance. And I know there's a lot of that information now that's out online. Um, grades, you know, you know, monitor grades. If they start, you got a straight A, a, a uh, student and they start going down, you, you may want to pay attention to that pretty quickly. Um, emotional changes, and I know that's hard with teenagers. Um, if your child tells you about a safety issue, be careful of your response, right? So um, you have to understand that if your child has trusted you enough to come to, to you with something, um, it's not about you, it's about their safety. And so you're, you're at this precipice where you can either do and say something that will draw them closer to you or push them further away. And that's your practical reality at that moment. So it's not about the fact that you may have told them not to, not to send, um, you know, maybe you've talked to them about sexting. 
and they did it anyway. It's not about them disobeying you. It's about how do you keep them safe. And so that's, that's, that, that's, that's a piece of advice here. And the other thing is that, um, you know, there are good resources out there. And the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children um, has resources and information that if there is explicit material out on the internet about, about your child, and actually about you even, there are ways to actually get that taken down. And so um, they can help with that. Uh, there's a great resource, connectsafely.org, uh, um, um, that has parent guidelines. And so those are practical things that, um, that you all can do um, to help, um, you know, help, help keep your, your, your kids safe. So um, I wanted to just give the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the schools uh, a little bit of time to talk about their resources. And, and a couple of things, and I'm um, uh, going to uh, call up uh, Shannon uh, Wingert to, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, to talk about um, the school resources. And again, why don't you just come over here? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, Spotsylvania actually is a school district that we hold up to others and say, and say, you know, we would like the type of engagement that we get in Spotsylvania County with others. I remember a number of years ago, um, uh, um, uh, I went to see Dr. Baker and um, there were a couple of um, school board members who, no, who are, are no longer school board members um, who were with us. and. Um, um, and, you know, he had an open door and he talked to us about it. Um, later, uh, Michelle Swisher, who couldn't be here tonight, um, I know that she and others, um, you know, made sure that there, were, there was training uh, for a number of the, the members. And so Shannon's going to talk to you about that. And um, so, again, we just want to really thank Spotsylvania County because from our perspective, um, you know, you're, you're out ahead of your peers. And so uh, we thank you for that. Thank you, and thank you for being here tonight and, and talking about this important topic in our community. Some of the school resources um, is just to be aware of your school-based mental health staff that are in all buildings, K-12. So all buildings have a school social worker, at least one school counselor, a school psychologist, and um, our school resource officers, who's a partner with the Spotsylvania County Sheriff's Office. So those are the staff that make up your school-based mental health teams, and we have all been trained um, in how to look for signs of human trafficking, to support families if that is something that they are experiencing. And another one that's not up there is our school registrars. So they are really um, the front lines when you go into a school and you're registering a student or you're asking for information. Um, they had also received a, a very brief training on kind of just signs, if they had concerns, if there was any questions, who they could uh, reach out to and get support if they thought that um, it might be a concern for a family that was coming in and, and registering. So I think that's another important piece of the puzzle as far as schools. And how, how we support our children is, I think that first one right up there is, is building relationships and just being present being um, active in our schools, in our schools, in our communities, supporting kids. Um, Michelle mentioned Michelle Swisher, who works um, tirelessly with our McKinney-Vento population, which is our homeless and displaced family population. So she works really closely with them and helping to meet those basic needs so that we can try to minimize some of those risk factors and provide them with more protective factors. And um, our social work team is amazing with connecting families and children with community resources. And um, we just encourage everybody to be willing to seek one of us out, one of those school-based mental health providers, knowing that you will be um, greeted with listening ears and somebody that is definitely going to find the information and, and give you all the help that you need. Thank you, Shannon. Um, the last slide here, and then we're going to move on to our panel. So I'm going to ask our panelists to maybe uh, get uh, to, to, to go up, up there, um, is that uh, we have other resources. So um, emergency calls 911, um, Central Virginia Justice Initiative, that's our organization, 
Our CASA has a 24-7 hotline, uh, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, great resources. Um, parental uh, control guides for, for device, um, uh, protect young eyes. Shared Hope International has some really fantastic webinars. And so I really appreciate, um, I appreciate that. We're gonna take a minute now to get our, um, our uh, panelists um, up uh, on, uh, um, uh, in place. Um, so thank you very much. So, um, uh, Megan Cole from ARCASA has agreed to be our moderator for this evening. Um, and that would be fantastic. And so the way that tonight is gonna work with the, with the panel is that um, we have some uh, prepared questions that are really focused on getting information out to the public. Um, and once that has, uh, once we've been through those uh, questions, we're happy to take some uh, some uh, uh, questions or some responses from the um, uh, from the or some questions from the audience. So, Tiffany, did you want to? Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, uh, with that, I'm going to give it uh, give the. Uh, um, Are you comfortable doing it? You don't have to answer the question if you don't have to answer it. It's okay. Uh, I'm going to. Yeah, right there. Uh, Perfect. Let, let Megan take it over. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Michelle. So as she mentioned, my name is Megan, and I'm the Community Service Specialist with the Rappahannock Council Against Sexual Assault. I will be serving as our moderator today, and then we have a few panelists that will um, answer some pre-questions that we have, and then we'll open it up to any questions from the audience. Um, to, just to start, uh, can each panelist introduce himself, kind of provide a brief description of your background and what specifically you or your organization is doing to combat human trafficking? We just can go um, from the closest to me all the way down, if you would like. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tiffany. I'm the volunteer coordinator at the Rappahannock Council Against Sexual Assault. Um, my background is mostly supporting volunteers who devote their time, um, who work directly with uh, victims and survivors of sexual violence. I'm Shannon Winker, and I'm the supervisor of elementary counseling for Spotsylvania County Schools. This is a new role for me, and prior to this, I was a school counselor at one of our elementary schools for the last 10 years. Hi, my name is Barbara Jane Wilson, and I am a survivor of familiar um, human trafficking. I'm also an author of two books, um, Mupa Now I Speak, and Blessings After Going Through the Valley. Um, and my purpose um, as a motivational speaker is to not just share what I've gone through and survival, but also to bring awareness and understanding to those that do not know much about familiar trafficking. Presently, I am helping to um, uh, work with uh, politicians to help change legislation to um, uh, protect survivors, uh, children and adults alike. Great, thank you everyone for taking the time to introduce yourself. And I know we had a few panelists who unfortunately could not be here with us today, um, but I thank them for um, 
their preparation that they did and some pre-answers that they've provided for us to share with you guys as well. Um, so just moving forward with some of the questions, um, we kind of covered this a little bit in our presentation, but what are some misconceptions about this crime? I, I can start. Go ahead. Um, and I'll be speaking from the focus point of familiar trafficking. Um, in my case, I was trafficked by my mother, and it started, I'm sorry, it started at the age of eight, and it went on until I was 13. And how it started out was, it started out first um, as sexual abuse by her boyfriend. And when I went to tell her, she told me not to tell anyone, because that's how the rent was getting paid. And so when it comes to familiar trafficking, what people don't understand and realize is that you don't see a lot of, of, they don't, first of all, it's not talked about at all. Um, and so, so you don't get to wonder if a child is being trafficked. The signs that I showed, especially since I was in elementary school, um, teachers should have been aware that something was going on only because, and it was mentioned when Michelle was, you know, calling out some pointers up there, my whole personality changed. Um, when it came to adults, since it was the adults that was abusing me, I had no respect for them. I started talking back to the teachers, and what they should have recognized was, and I'll just throw Friday out as an example. Friday, I'm playing with my classmates, we have lunch, and at the end of the day, the teacher says, everyone have a great weekend, see you on Monday. I come in on Monday, I'm not the person that you saw on Friday. And the question that is asked is, why are you acting up? Why are you so bad? Why are you being disrespectful? Go to the principal's office. So teachers have to pay attention but don't assume that the child is acting up to be acting up. The child is acting up because, in my case, I just wanted you to ask me the question, is everything okay at home because you wasn't like this? Probably wouldn't have told them, but those are some of the things. And there's just a lot more um, that goes into familiar trafficking, but you know, I'll let someone else um, speak. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, I'm honored to be in your presence and learn from you. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from uh, victims and survivors. Um, I think another misconception about human trafficking is that uh, it is confused a lot with human smuggling. Um, and the truth is that it happens right here at home. Um, and so it's important for us to be on high alert about those things. Um, yeah, There's another misconception uh, that I won't go too much into, uh, but human trafficking, uh, just for the record, is not the same as uh, sex work. Uh, so I think that's important to remember, just uh, so we keep those people's rights in mind. Um, however, uh, I know that's not really the topic that we're on right now, because this is focused on our kids, but I think it's important to um, remember. Thank you both. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yes, um, I, I, I want to have the misconception recognize that so much of the population, thanks to the media and Hollywood, it put out movies like Taken, to where you know they make it like you know somebody from far away is going to come and snatch your kid up off the street and, and send them overseas. Yes, that happens, but it's normally only one percent of the population. Most of the time, as Barbara told you, it's by somebody that they know you know, family member, um, stepdad, stepmom, uh, cousin, uh, next door neighbor, teacher, <laughs> okay, it, it happens. And, you know, as y'all I'm sure are aware, you know, the, the little girl that was almost abducted up in Stafford at Embry Mills subdivision, we don't know what that was, uh, what the motivation behind it, that was the first thing I thought of. 
you know, um, because it, that kind of thing does happen every single day across this country. Um, another misconception is that, uh, it, especially when it comes to our high school kids, you know, it's harder to recognize because, you know, they're discovering themselves and their sexuality and so forth. And, you know, um, once the kids get older, you know, parents have this misconception that they don't really need to keep an eye on them as much. And that couldn't be further from the truth. That is when parents really need to pay attention the most because they are exploring their sexuality, because they are venturing out and making new connections, especially online. And that is the other thing is that, uh, and it really wasn't um, brought up very much, but we, we do have the, the sexting and we do have predators online that are having their kids just online. They're not coming into their homes or getting them off the street. They're getting in touch with them online and having them do stuff online in front of the camera to make money that way. And, you know, the signs are all there, but a lot of them are subtle. And um, there's just so many complexities behind it. Uh, but those are several that I just wanted to mention. Absolutely. First, I just want to say thank you to Barbara for sharing your story with us today um, and to both of our other two panelists that answered that question for us. Um, Tiffany actually graciously um, briefly discussed our next question. Um, you know, we hear about the term human trafficking a lot. But how prevalent is it actually within our own community? Um, well, I, I would like to um, add to that. I'm from this. I, I'm a native from Stafford in Spotsylvania. Um, I was sexually abused by two family members from the ages of three to seven years old. Um, one was my brother who was being abused at the same time. He was only three years older than I was. So. You know, uh, that is another thing is that kids will act out their abuse on other kids, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's not that they can help that they're trying to make sense of it. Um, the other abuser, of course, was the male adult and he would take pornographic pictures of me and give me money to keep quiet while he was abusing me. So, you know, the, this, this kind of thing happens, you know, and, and thank you, Barbara, for opening up. I, I, went into detail about my life yesterday uh, in front of legislation, so I don't really have the energy to do it today. Um, but I, I just, I thank Spotsylvania for, for doing this. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you for being here, Barbara. I can't wait to get to know you. Um, you know, the, 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 the short answer to the question is, yes, it does happen here. Um, if if that were if it weren't the case we wouldn't have clients <laughs> um, and um, uh, the uh, unfortunately we had to reschedule this because of weather um, um, last month and um, we were going to have uh, Sergeant Northrop from the uh, Spotsylvania County Sheriff's Office and um, he tried to rearrange his you know he has a pretty busy schedule he tried to rearrange his schedule so that he could get here tonight but um, uh, yesterday he called me and just said, I, I, I just can't do it, I'm so sorry. And so, um, you know, I said, is there anything that you would like for us to convey to those who are, um, who, who are, are watching this? And he said, well, he said, you know, yeah, we are working cases. Um, and, um, you know, the, the cases that they are working are, tend to be connected to gangs and to drugs, right? So. Um, think about those two things. Do we have them in our community? Yes, we absolutely do. And so um, those crimes are, are, are connected. And so um, he, actually, he, he also wanted to convey that, you know, they do work, uh, they have worked with our organization um, to help, um, you know, to help survivors. We've gotten calls um, um, from, from, uh, from Spotsylvania County uh, to help um, sometimes, um, you know, victims don't want help and you've got to meet them where they are. Um, sometimes uh, they want to go, there's a, there's a safe family member and they want to go to that safe ma family member. Um, sometimes that's not the case, um, you know, and so, um, you know, just, um, I don't, uh, I just wanted to convey his, his, he was sorry that he w wasn't able to be here, but he did just want to, want to um, convey those two things, so. Absolutely. Um, 
Michelle just said. Um, when she mentioned that the victims don't want to go with the person, what people don't understand is um, once their trust is broken, they're not going with anyone. Because I know for me, and I have a perfect example, I remember running away from home. And I basically was going to run to my father's house. And my mother came looking with me for the police. Now you have to understand with familiar trafficking, I'm not going outside. They're bringing them in the house. And they're feeding me drugs, alcohol. Even when I had the courage to say no, one of the men put a gun to my head and said, no one tells me no. And so when I ran away um, and she came with the police officer, for me, the police officer was in safety. The police officer was someone who paid her to do what he wanted to do to me. The mistake that the police officer made, you have a child that's screaming and crying, I don't want to go home, I don't want to go home, can I go to my father's? And my father had even said, can't she just come and stay the night with me? And the police officer said, that's for the family court to make that decision. And he left. The mistake he made was, why is this child so adamant about not going home? Why is she screaming? Why is she kicking? Instead of asking the question, what's going on? Most people know all kids want to stay with their mothers. So when you have a child kicking, screaming, crying that they don't want to go home and be with the mother, that's a red flag, number one. So for me, it took a long time for me to even look at a police officer as someone who would protect me. And because you're bringing the men into the house, the other thing that wouldn't have been noticed is that my mother is from a large family. And men always came over, uncles, cousins. So my neighbor would never have thought anything strange to see people coming and going all hours of the night. So it makes it hard for a victim who's being trafficked in the home to, to reach out and call anyone. And in my case, because my mother was my first line of protection, and when she told me that, she broke that trust, so I can't trust anyone else. So those are some of the things that you know, you have to pay attention. I mean, it was even, you know, the men across the street. It was folks on the block. So quite naturally, they're not going to share with anyone what they're doing. They're just coming over to the house. People thought they're coming over there playing cards. They're not playing cards. They're actually taking me into the bedroom to do whatever it was that they wanted to do. So when it comes to um, victims of human trafficking, a lot of them will actually um, connect with someone from the gang because he will promise to protect them. Even though he's putting them out there, in her mind, he's going to still protect her. He's not going to let anything bad happen to her. But when it comes to, <clears throat> again, familiar trafficking, which is not talked about, um, Human trafficking, I mean, that's all you hear. But you rarely hear about familiar trafficking and what goes on and who's actually, you know, behind it. And so that's what I wanted to um, make clear is that we don't come to you because we don't trust you. Because if you tell me, say, for instance, Michelle, say, take my number, call me anytime. So if I call Michelle at 3 o'clock in the morning, I expect for Michelle to come where I am. I do not expect for Michelle to say, Barbara, let me give you to someone. Take this number. I'm going to hang up because she just passed me off to someone else. So you didn't keep your word. So how, would I, how can I trust you? And that's, those are some of the key things that you have to remember. 
Absolutely. Um, before we move on to our next question, I just want to briefly say thank you to both our survivors again for being here and sharing your story with us. Um, I definitely know it's not an easy topic to talk about and it can be exhausting to have to repetitively tell your story, um, but it takes telling your story for the community sometimes to be aware and actively know the impact it has within our own community. Um, I think this is a perfect point um, to kind of segue into um, discussing, you know, you mentioned that there's a lack of trust with law enforcement at some point. Um, so can you kind of briefly mention what other school resources and training are available for students and parents? Yes, um, I think we were talking a lot about um, recognizing the signs and just being aware of who our, our students are. I think our teachers do an amazing job of connecting with kids and, and building those relationships. We have done a lot of work on trauma sensitive schools. So um, teaching all of our staff members about being trauma informed and trauma informed practices. And then we have also done a lot of work on ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and being able to first of all, know what those are, to recognize them, to um, just consider those, and that um, really looking at the big picture, asking questions, um, talking to other people that are working with the child. So I feel like we are um, doing a lot of professional development and learning, and then making sure that that learning gets to the teachers that are working with our kids every day. Absolutely. I know we also have some of our local advocacy agencies out. So if any of you guys would like to add in kind of what resources you have available um, as well, that would be great. Sure. Um, uh, uh, we actually um, deal predominant really with adults um, at this point. Um, and, but um, we do offer uh, resources where um, what we try to do is we try to connect um, survivors with resources within the community um, or try to meet them where they are, they're at. So um, depending upon where they, they are, um, uh, and, and this also meant that we had to define success differently. <laughs> so um, sometimes it's I just give them a backpack that has, you know, a change of clothes and some, so some information, and they take that, and that may be all that they're willing to do. Um, you know, we've had other, other situations where, you know, we've worked with somebody, say, in the jails for, um, for a long period of time, or a long period of time for us, so, so many months. And so when they got out, they actually uh, were willing to um, work with us on a, uh, we actually worked with them before they got out on a plan on where they, uh, where they're, where they were going to go live at um, um, when they got out. And so I remember this one case um, because uh, she was still in contact with him in the jail. And um, she told me that and there was a, a point where she told me she had broken off all communication. And when I knew he was done with her was when he turned her phone off. And it was, it was like we had this wrestling, we were wrestling with, and you felt like, you felt relieved that, um, and, and so when she got out, we were able to um, get her connected with, um, um, connect it with some, some housing and, um, you know, help her with a number of other things that she needed. Um, but, um, you know, we've had people that over years, right? So we met someone in 2015, um, ran into her again in 2017. Um, and this was somebody who I was not sure that the, that the result was going to be a good one. I thought that maybe one day we might be hearing that um, someone had found her um, to see someplace. It was, there's a lot going on there. Um, but over the years, she's asked for a little more, a little more. Um, you know, this summer she asked for um, some, uh, some additional, uh, additional help with some health care and with some mental health needs. And so um, she's been out of life for a couple of years now. Um, and so um, 
you just have to be patient and everyone you just have to meet them where they are and if where they are is they're just going to take that backpack from you because it's got some stuff that they need in it that's okay that's a win i'll take that because you know what six months they may be calling me again and i'm okay with that and we've had that we've had these these situations where over the years I have one young lady who just calls me every couple of, or every six months or a year because she's she gets scared, and so we sit down, we talk about what's her plan, and that's okay, because because the bad thing that she thought wasn't happen was gonna might happen. She's got a plan, makes her feel better, and even though it didn't happen, she had a plan. So um, you know, I, I hope I answered the question. So. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I agree with Michelle. We have to meet um, victims and survivors where they're at. Um, and I just want to share a resource. I know we have tons of info in the back of the room for those who are here tonight. Uh, but I also want to provide our hotline number to the Rappahannock Council Against Sexual Assault. Um, we're available 24-7, 365, um, holidays included, anytime that anybody needs um, help with sexual violence. Um, I will say it for those who are listening in tonight, 540-371-1666. Uh, and that is our hotline number. Um, so if you ever need resources for um, sexual violence or if you are looking to help someone who's experienced sexual violence, absolutely you can call that hotline as well. Wonderful. So I know we're approaching our 7.30 time pretty quickly, so I'll just ask two brief questions, and then I'll open it up to the floor if they have any questions. So I'm really know, uh, interested in knowing the answer to this question. What is a skip party? And how do traffickers use that to groom and lure in teenagers? And does it happen with our, our own community? Okay. One by the gangs. Yeah. And why don't you tell them? I, I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you. A lot of these new terms are something I didn't identify with um, because mine wasn't necessarily gangs that trucked me. It was drug dealers that took advantage of my drug addiction. However, um, it, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, they, they bring you in, and it, it's breaking you in, you know. Um, and... It, basically branding you as theirs okay and it's a test to especially for those that are desperate to belong you know they're willing to do anything um and then that's where they get caught up in bondage of it and you know it, it all ties into you know the the sex trafficking and the drug trafficking goes hand in hand with the gangs and with the drug dealers on the streets and with the vulnerable women men and boys and girls i mean it it, it doesn't you know discriminate um between genders um between ages um yeah and you might want to go into some more detail because this is a relatively new term for me yeah I, I, it's it's skip parties truancy parties um um you know it, it it's uh you know, it is a quote unquote party that happens during the day, although while well, kids should be in school, although sometimes it, it, it isn't during the day, it may be during the weekend. Um, but um, typically what happens is that, um, um, you know, my experience has been with, with girls being uh, lured to a party. And I shouldn't say, I should say lured in terms of, um, uh, some grooming and then invite it to a party and um, um, uh, Desiree's right um, uh, a lot of gangs use this um, so when they get to the party there's alcohol maybe drugs and um, they're given kind of the little loyalty speech so I mentioned that loyalty is really important and so they're kind of given this little loyalty speech you know we're you know, um, you know, where are your crew, um, uh, so forth. And um, um, in the case that I know of in, in this region, um, in addition to that loyalty speech, they started giving them nicknames. Um, another very big red sign, like do do do. Um, but um, uh, um, there, there actually was a skip party that I was aware of in the region 
and it was actually broken up by a mother who, was, who, who found out her daughter was in school and should have been in school. And then she used social media to figure out where she was and then went and then called the police or called the sheriff's office to come break it up. It was amazing. Like I told, I, she called me the next day and uh, invited me, said, I need to talk to you. And um, so we went to a Starbucks and we were talking at, about it. And, and I just told her, I said, you are my hero. How many parents would have just waited till their kids got home to yell at them? She went and she realized that there was a threat and she went and she, she, she got, her, uh, got her daughter and, and you know, several other young ladies um, out of that situation. But, um, you know, adult men, um, you know, giving them a little loyalty, feeding them drugs and alcohol and giving them nicknames. Um, and let, let me just tell you, there are, you know, if, if there's any, any uh, you know, youth out there who, uh, who are uh, women who think, or, or who are girls who think that you will be, um, that you're gonna be a female gang member, there's something else they're gonna be doing to you. And that's gonna be selling you. Um, so um, um, in that case, uh, I hope I answered the question and gave you a good example, but um, it happens. Um, and it's certainly something that, um, you know, if you're paying attention as a parent, you're making sure you know, you, you know, you, you know your kids are in school or not in school, um, you know, it's something to pay attention to, so. Can I, I, I have to, what is it, interject? Because oh, sorry if I. No, oh. because the word parent. Yeah. You keep saying parent. Sorry. Has to pay attention to your kids. Parents, you need to know what your kids are doing. Oh, parents, um, know who your kids' friends are. Parents, parents, parents. But with familiar trafficking, it's the parent. So my parent is watching me. My parent is selling me. My parent is telling me not to tell anyone so, and for me, I actually became a protector of my mother because one of the things that I noticed was when I said no, her boyfriend would beat her up. So for me, it was, I need to protect my mother, even though she's not protecting me. I will let them do whatever they need to do to me so that he doesn't hurt her. Um, and so, so what ends up happening is, you know, after a while I started fighting back. Um, and then once, you know, I started fighting back, the parent, instead of standing by me, stood by him and, you know, eventually threw me out of the house. Back in my day, we didn't have, you know, CJ, CJVC. I know I'm probably getting the initial CJI, wrong. That's okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, just as we didn't have any of that. So how did I survive? Number one, I became a young mother. Number two, I got deeper into drugs and alcohol. And a lot of times, I didn't have the money to pay. So therefore, my body became so I ended up becoming a prostitute um, in order to survive and take care of not just myself, but my daughter. Um, because again, um, you, you, you're doing what you're taught and if it's okay for them to do it to me, then it's okay for me um, to do it. To, but my case was different. I'm going to do everything that I can to protect my daughter and make sure none of that happens. So when you say a parent, there are a lot of kids, you know, could even be in your school who's actually being trafficked by a parent. And so knowing if I tell on my mother, it also means getting child services involved get child services involved, child services is going to come and take me away. I don't know where they're going to take me, not saying that all foster system, you know, homes are bad, 
but there are some that are. So it's, I, I'm safer being with my mother than going into the system. One, what I'm grateful for now is that, you know, I receive a lot of invitations to come and speak, not just about familiar trafficking, but also from the police department to come and train them on what are we missing? What should we be looking for? What should we be saying? And so that's the main point that I want everyone to understand. For some of us, your parent isn't your safety net. And, and thank you for making that, that point. I tried, to, I tried to make the difference between familial and non-familial in the presentation, and I am so grateful that you're here to, to, to say that. And, um, and I apologize for not uh, being clear about, about that situation. Um, so um, in, in this particular skip party, it was a, a parent paying attention who, who broke it up, but that, that may not always be the case for, for a lot of people. So thank you so much. Absolutely. So just looking at the time, um, I just kind of briefly want to add on to that question um, and say I definitely did learn something new tonight, so thank you. Um, and thank you, Barbara, for bringing up a good point that, as we mentioned, you know, it, parents can have things that they should do, um, but it's not just on them to watch these things. We also encourage, you know, teachers, counselors, friends to watch out for these signs and be aware. Um, and speak up if they do see these signs occurring. Um, do you have something you want to add briefly? Yes, uh, something that just came to my mind. You know, uh, the psychological trauma and the psychological bondage that traffickers, family members, wh whoever is doing it, has such a powerful hold on our kids and on adults that are being trafficked that th that sense of loyalty is a lot of times unbreakable, you know, because the fear of the unknown of what's going to happen if you're taken, if, if, you know, I, I'm taken away, you know, I was part of the foster care system all my life, you know, so I do know that part of it. But the, this, I, I, I can't stress this enough is, is that what Michelle was talking about is, is, yes, the difficulty of connecting to the kids once they're being trafficked it's paramount that teachers, counselors, principals, law enforcement need to understand, you know, it's not that they're trying to be a problem. They are trying to work this out in their head. What am I supposed to do? What am I not supposed to say? How, you know, <laughs> they're being psychologically traumatized just as badly as they're being sexually and physically traumatized. And I just really can't stress that enough to those administrators and those that are in our audience today. Thank you. Absolutely. So we'll try to make this last question pretty brief. If you guys just want to share one or two things that community members can do themselves to get involved in combating human trafficking. Well, as a, the volunteer coordinator of our CASA, I feel like I have to say, you can always volunteer with our organization. We always need people who are dedicated to the cause to make a difference. Um, it takes each individual in the community to make a community, so. Um, I'll go briefly and, and share a personal, very brief story. My daughter is 12 years old and is in the Spotsylvania school systems. We just moved from Stafford. And I will tell you that one of her friends in Stafford, at the time we lived in a low income neighborhood up there, um, she was using my daughter's phone and she was communicating with who she thought was a 14 year old boy and come to find out. And I, I still have the screenshots, but there's nothing law enforcement can do because we don't know where this guy came from. But the language was very explicit and it was very obvious it was not a 14 year old boy. And of course I flipped out because this is on my daughter's phone. So as, as school um, administrators and, and, and parents and family members pay, pay attention to who your kids are hanging out with, pay attention to what they're doing on their phones. I don't care how mad they get. I don't how, care how difficult they get. If it means you got to take the phones away to keep them safe, so be it. So be it. Let them take the phone to school, to, you know, to back and forth. But when they get home, take it away. It's not going to kill them. It's not going to kill you. Monitor their phones and their computers 24-7. That is the most important thing I can tell 
parents in, in the community. It drives me nuts of how much I have to take control of my daughter's phone. She drives me insane. But better for me to be driven insane and keep her safe than for her to have the same thing happen to her as it did to me. And parents, grandparents, friends, stop posting your babies in the bathtub yes. on Facebook. That's where the predators hang out. I actually had an opportunity to speak for Homeland Security, um, the FBI in Fayetteville, Arkansas last year. One of the persons on the panel, he does age progression when you see the missing kids on the milk carton. He spoke for maybe 10 minutes after that he says, I'll be right back. And he's standing behind a curtain. And he changed his whole, his voice from a 40-year-old to a 10-year-old. And then he came out, and it wasn't the same person. So he was, basically what he was sharing was, your kids think that they're speaking to someone their age. And it's an adult. And again, I, I agree. Check out your kid's phone. Also, their friends, because whether it's familiar trafficking or human trafficking, it's a huge money-making operation. You have the Super Bowl coming up, and that's where a lot of money is going to be made. Your f if you have kids that are high school or even college, they are also selling their friends into human trafficking. Um, because you can, depending on where they're at, they're offered like $200. If you can get your friend to come to this party, you know, bring 10 of your friends at $200 each. And what she does is she'll take them to the party, but then she'll let them know, I'm just going to the restroom or I'm going to, once she leaves, they're stuck. That's it for them. You know, so you have to be aware of not just, you know, who your kids are talking to on social media, but even that best friend that's right across the street. Absolutely. Um, I guess one of the things that I would say is that in, you know, one of the things we try to convey is that, um, uh, you know, not just here tonight, but in uh, any other discussions we have, is that there are um, people who have vulnerabilities, and there are a large number of vulnerabilities. And we shared some here tonight, um, uh, ch children that are at high risks. Um, you know, when people ask me what we can do, well, um, we really need to take care of people who are vulnerable in our society. And that means actually getting involved. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to tell you, being an advocate for human trafficking is not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but, um, you know, there are a number of other vulnerabilities. And so, you know, um, homelessness. Um, you know, financial vulnerabilities. I mean, there's, there are numerous mental health, mental health issues, exactly. And so, you know, when somebody asks me, you know, um, I mean, we can give you materials on learning the signs and that sort of thing, and we can train people who are in um, vocations like first responders and others um, on what they should be looking for. Um, but just the average person, um, you know, if we can reduce the if we can reduce the vulnerability the vulnerability in our society, that's going to go a long way. Um, and then the the last thing I would say is this is not just a supply issue; it is a demand issue too. So if there are people, so if there is a de, if there is, you know, traffickers who are selling kids are doing are, are wouldn't do it if there weren't people buying. And so, um, you know, when I, when I go different places and I talk about this and 
um, you know, I talk about demand. You know, you got a lot of people who start looking at their shoes. And, um, you, know, you know, that's something we don't like to talk about. Um, you know, I've been in, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with, with many survivors who, you know, have spent different uh, times in jail, have had different types of charges related to their trafficking. Um, and, you know, there are cases where, and uh, Desiree reminded me that, uh, of this, there are, there are some jurisdictions that send the, the, John, the, the buyers to John School. That's all they get. So, um, you know, there are a lot of things that we need to talk about, but, you know, I think the number one thing is, is if we can reduce vulnerability, that'll go a long way. So. Shannon, do you have anything you wanted to add in? No, I think I would just echo everybody's sentiment and that, um, you know, to continue these conversations and to, you know, make sure that this isn't something that we talk about once a year or every other year, that it's, um, you know, just a, a topic that we continue to, to talk about. I, I would like to ask the school board a, a question because I'm a parent of a child in, in your school system now. Do you all have educational um, conversations with the children of Spotsylvania School about human trafficking? No, that it's, it's not in, to my knowledge, it's not. I know that, and you might, Michelle might be able to speak to this, at the elementary level, no, but I know that I believe your organization and maybe our CASA sometimes will visit high schools and talk to students in their health classes. Um, along, they do classes on you know healthy relationships and dating and things like that. So I do believe for the older kids it is brought up. Is it possible we could start a conversation about maybe implementing it on all school um, levels because it starts, you know, there's, there's a law called Aaron's Law. I don't know of Virginia, I don't know if she has implemented it here in the schools of Virginia about educating the kids about sexual abuse in the schools. And I know there's a big hoopla going on right now within our school boards with different subject matters, but this is a life or death situation. I mean, even if they don't physically die, their souls die once this kind of thing happens. And it takes a long time, if ever, to get them stable again to where they can heal. So wouldn't you think that we should plan some type of preventative measures now while they're little? I just want to add that um, our CASA is happy to come into the schools at any age level, at any time, any point during the semester. Um, that's something that we want to do. Um, and so if you as parents or administrators or teachers are interested in that, we are here for it and we're ready to come in. We've done it at a couple of schools, but we'd love to be in every single one of them and every single <coughs> age group. Absolutely. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I just want to interject with that. Um, thank you for bringing up that question and to add on to it. I actually spent five hours today emailing every single health and PE teacher in the planning <laughs> district 16. So if you are a Spotsylvania <laughs> health and PE teacher um, here or listening in, please check your emails. <laughs> um, so now we'll just open it up to the floor. And if you guys have any questions you would like to ask the panel, free free, feel free to come up to the um, podium. Absolutely. Okay. If you want to ask afterward, that's perfectly fine. Um, Michelle, do you have any closing remarks you want to add? No. I, I, again, I just want to thank um, Spotsylvania uh, County Public Schools. And, um, you know, again, you guys are, um, you know, have been supportive of um, our efforts, um, not just to raise awareness, to, but to bring prevention. Uh, we've been in uh, several of the schools um, for a number of years now. Um, you know, talking about, uh, talking to kids about prevention education and so forth. Um, but also, you started educating yourselves before, um, you know, before uh, any discussion at the General Assembly level about any requirements. Um, and, you know, um, as, as someone, sometimes I think that, um, you know, there's an old say, saying, I was country when country wasn't cool. Um, I remember, you know, back in 2013, the only people that, you know, were 
be believe in me, or not believing me, but understood that this was an issue was when I went and talked to law enforcement, because they were seeing it. And, um, and, but the schools, you know, uh, you know uh, when we came in to talk to the schools, um, you know, they listened to us, and we started seeing some changes. And um, so, from our perspective, um, we want to be, we, we, we are very grateful. Um, we are also honored to have Spotsylvania sit on the Planning District 16 um, uh, uh, Human Trafficking Task Force, and that task force is made up of a number of NGOs as well as survivors of trafficking, um, where we want to try to connect all our resources and work better. Uh, we, are not an, we are not a jurisdiction that has um, you know, um, the resources of some of the larger cities. Um, so we gotta work smarter with the resources that we have. And so um, having the, the schools engaged in that is incredibly important. And we are so grateful for Spotsylvania County Schools for doing that. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you all the panelists for being here today and everyone in the audience and those who turned in, tuned in virtually.